Uh, so this is patient EL. It's a 44-year-old uh, financial fraud investigator who was um, in San Diego for a vacation with his family. Uh, he presented with severe neck pain and inability to hold his head up following an injury while he was surfing. He felt like he was uh, coming in on a wave. The, um, the surfboard came out from under him and he feels like it hit him in the back of the neck. He's pretty sure he did not drive into the sandbar uh, with his head. I denied a loss of consciousness uh, or weakness in his arms or his legs following the injury, and he was actually able to ambulate back up onto the beach uh, by himself, did not need any assistance from lifeguards or anything like that. He did note occasional radiating pain from the posterior neck into the bilateral trapezii as well as his posterior shoulders. Uh, they did not radiate uh, distal to the shoulders or the elbows. He doesn't have any significant past medical or surgical history. Uh, so this is his mid-sagittal uh, view. You can see he has uh, an approximately 25% subluxation of C5 on C6 with an acute kyphosis. Um, so just looking at this image, um, one can guess that this is likely a unilateral facet dislocation um, without even needing to see the facets. Generally, about 25% um, subluxation uh, indicates that one of the facets is dislocated and the other is either perched or uh, intact. And so what we see here is the patient has a left uh, dislocated facet uh, with a superior articular process fracture of C6. And on the right side, as expected, he uh, is located. He has distracted that facet a little bit, um, which is consistent with his kyphotic deformity, but you can see it has not dislocated over the top. So what would be everyone's next steps after uh, Dr. Johnson's excellent presentation after seeing this imaging and, and getting this exam. He skipped the he skipped the unilateral facet dislocation, so I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that? He skipped the part about the said he had to skip over the unilateral facet dislocation oh. part of the final yeah. answer. <laughs> so um just use using okay. even just what do folks do with, with this? Go back to the x-rays. So he's presented to the ER. These are his initial CAT scan imaging. He has no other imaging and he's intact. Uh, D Dr. I Johnson. I'd want him, yeah, yeah, exactly. Andrew, Dr. Johnson, what, what would what would be your next step here? So he's intact. Um, then uh, I think it is reasonable to um, go ahead with a MRI for uh, complete evaluation. Okay, I think that's an excellent idea. Is there any other scan that you might think about other than an MRI here? Uh, also. Um, be concerned about his uh, potentially his vertebral artery. Um, kids, if you're getting the CT, I'm do a CT A as well. Um, although you do see some of that on the MRR as well. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So those were the next steps that we took. So he had a uh, CT angiogram. Uh, I have a representative cut here showing that basically he has no uh, evidence of vertebral artery injury at that level. Um, so we've ruled that out. And he also had an MRI, uh, which you can see shows again that he has an acute kypho kyphotic deformity. Uh, he has significant injury to his posterior ligamentous complex. Um, and uh, luckily for him, he actually has uh, enough, even at his most stenotic level, uh, secondary to the injury, he still has room for the cord uh, with no significant cord signal abnormality. Now, why MRI before putting them in traction? So, so MRI in this case, I think is reasonable because he's intact. Um, that being said, uh, it's not unreasonable to consider a closed reduction in this case because it's an awake alert patient um, that is able to give you a neurologic exam. So right. it's reasonable to consider a, an attempt at a closed reduction with traction in the emergency department here. Um, so we actually, when I was initially seeing this patient, I discussed with uh, 
this with uh, Dr. Bagheri, and we actually discussed the uh, potential for closed reduction in this patient, especially since there was a little bit of pushback about the MRI because of a BB that he had in his arm. Uh, they eventually relented on that. But um, we, we, dis we actually discussed the possibility of closed reduction and, and the, um, how that would work logistically in the ER and everything, and, and ultimately decided that uh, given his stable nature, um, that it was reasonable to get the MRI and, and determine our plans based on that. Yeah, radiology was refusing to get the MRI because the guy had a BB in his elbow. <laughs> so I said, luckily, I, be a I dangerous go, BB. I, I go. We're oh, gonna, you should have transferred care to them. I go. Should have said gonna, then you take care of them. I go. We're gonna go ahead and get the MRI, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, they allowed us to get this excellent MRI, and Ridiculous. BB did not come flying out of his arm. <laughs> so I'll deal with the consequences of the MRI at the bedside. What was that? You should have just done a BBectomy at the bedside. Interestingly, I actually asked the patient about uh, what happened when he had the initial BB, and he said they did an exploration and were not able to recover it. So, <laughs> and it was in his medial <laughs> elbow. Uh, so it was a little bit, it would, bit of, would have been a little bit of a, uh, a uh, hairy situation to go digging around in there in the ED. Sounds like a sounds like an ER doc adventure. It probably was. Um, <laughs> that being said, I don't think if if they really are refusing and you really need the MRI, I don't think it's unreasonable to to do an extraction of whatever metal implant he has in there. And you can do that in the ED or in the OR. But um, luckily, it wasn't a problem in this case. You can put a tourniquet above an elbow. No big deal. Yes. Yeah. So it would be pretty easy to reasonably easy to do. So um, going back to Dr. Johnson, I'm going to put you on the spot here. You went over the classifications, did a really good job with those. Um, how would you classify this according to the uh, SLIC classification? So he has uh, no neurologic uh, findings, I think, um, looking at that MR, there was no uh, disco ligamentous injury. Um, and do then you, regarding the more fault. Do you think there's no uh, injury to his posterior ligamentous complex? Uh, well, no, obviously there is actually since he has a set um, translation there, uh, subluxation. Um, so... That would be a two for the ligamentous complex. And then uh, the facet perch would be distraction um, in the morphology. So he would get a uh, five. Okay. So for distraction, that, that's a three. Um, I think uh, rotation, rotational deformities are a four, but you're right. Think about morphology and the disco ligamentous complex, which in him is, I think, clearly disrupted based on the MRI, uh, as well as the amount of translation that he has. Um, so that gives him a two. And because he's neurologically intact, he gets a zero. So that puts him at a total point, total of five points, um, which as you mentioned earlier, generally puts him in a surgical category. This is kind of an, a way for us to objectively show that this guy needs surgery, although I think uh, virtually all of the surgeons on the line here would, would recommend surgery for this guy, regardless of his um, SLIP classification here. But this gives us an objective way to think about this. What about the AO spine classification? So, Going to the facet injuries, um, I'd say the, to go to the F4, the pathologic subluxation or perch dislocated facet. Perfect. All right. So we've got it. So what are the next steps here in terms of treatment? So we have an intact guy. Uh, he has no vertebral artery injury. We have an MRI that shows he has a disrupted posterior ligamentous complex, no major uh, disc, um, and he uh, is has a uh, unilateral facet dislocation. So, Dr. Johnson, what do you think we should do next? <laughs> 
So uh, we had talked earlier about uh, closed reduction um, that could still be attempted. I know that uh, the unilateral, um, although obviously there is some disruption of the ligamentous complex, it is not as uh, complete as a, you know, a bilateral dislocation. So there is some um, discussion about a closed reduction being more difficult. Um, but I think it would still be worthy of an attempt uh, and then followed either by a open reduction um, or uh, fixation. Uh, there's also some discussion of whether or not um, these need to be uh, treated operatively. However, um, there has been a significant um, complication rate with non-operative management. So I think that that should be uh, treated operatively. Do you think it should be treated operatively from the back, the front, both? What do you think? Um, for the unilateral, I think uh, it could go either way if they had any significant uh, disc um, disruption or impingement, I don't remember uh, the MRI specifically, then you would want to go um, from the front. Um, so I, I would say you could probably do either. So those are all really good thoughts, Andrew. Um, I think a couple of things to note about this case is that it's a reasonably low uh, subaxial cervical level. The lower the level is, the more traction is generally needed for a reduction because you're kind of pulling like an accordion through all the levels above it. Um, and so the, amount, the larger the amount of weight you're expected to need. Additionally, because it's uh, a uni, unilateral facet dislocation, that puts you at a significant disadvantage in terms of getting a closed reduction. So closed reduction is definitely an option in this guy, but you have a reasonably high chance of being unsuccessful with it. So um, then the option, then the, the discussion is whether to try to do, if, you, if you're unable to get a closed reduction, whether you try to do an open reduction from the front or from the back. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, variability there in terms of the techniques uh, that you're able to do. Generally, it's thought to be a little bit easier from the back uh, to get a closed reduction. So what we did is we took him to the OR. We actually attempted a closed reduction with weight um, and uh, we were unsuccessful uh, getting a closed reduction with traction as could have been expected um, based on our previous discussion. Um, so we elected to go from the back um, because he had a disrupted posterior ligaments complex um, and the thought was that the reduction would be significantly easier uh, from that standpoint. Um, we did think about the disc in the front. There wasn't a major one, so we expected that we would be unlikely to need to do anything from the front, but if he did have an acute uh, drop in his neuromonitoring signals, then we were prepared to do a discectomy and in the front following reduction. So the, ultimately our technique was a posterior exposure we took, got a Penfield 4 into the um, joint and with a little axial traction and levering technique with the Penfield 4, we were able to reduce that facet nicely, confirmed on x-ray and then fixed it with a two-level um, fusion construct. And this is the before versus after uh, uh, lateral x-rays. So uh, just a quick literature review for subaxial cervical trauma. It looks like partially reduced just with positioning, huh? Uh, in terms of distraction, yes, it was, it was significantly reduced um, with, uh, with positioning. We did have a little bit of traction on the patient there. He's hanging in, um, in uh, tongs. So there's some distraction just from that, uh, but the translation was not really affected. Yeah, and so sometimes that facet stays perched even when you go, you know, go prone, you got to really get underneath it and flip it around. But it looks like just a little traction and positioning. Yeah. Did a lot of work for it. Great. So that, that definitely helped us, um, but we still needed that levering maneuver. So just, you know, Dr. Johnson already reviewed this, so I'll skip over it pretty quickly. But basically, you know, when these patients come in, always follow ATLS protocol. Their spinal 
uh, cord matters, but doesn't matter as much as their brain and their uh, ABCs. So if they have, uh, if they if they're bleeding into their brain or bleeding into their abdomen, uh, those things need to be basically ruled out first. Um, he needs to be, the patient should be put in a hard collar uh, during the primary uh, survey, and then he should get our examination. Um, in terms of cervical facet fractures and dislocations specifically, there's a bimodal distribution with the high energy mechanisms generally in young patients and low energy falls in older patients. The four stages of this injury have been described in theory by Allen and Ferguson. They start with a flexion sprain, then a unilateral dislocation, then a bilateral dislocation, and then finally a bilateral dislocation with 100% translation, uh, which is nearly always associated with a significant spinal cord injury. The further along that um, pathologic stage you are, the higher likelihood of a spinal cord injury. The facet fractures frequently involve the superior articular process of the uh, lower level. And then uh, recently radiographic predictors of spinal cord injury have been objectively evaluated. Um, and these are all kind of obvious to people who have treated these injuries, but they generally include facet dislocation, bilateral injuries, reduced Glasgow coma scale, spinal canal occlusion, and spinal cord compression. This is from a study in the Spine Journal in 2018 that actually evaluated radiographic parameters. The whole goal of this study was to show how to predict spinal cord injuries in obtunded patients for who an exam was not able to be performed, which is relatively common in these patients. So how do we determine the likelihood of an actual injury to their cord um, with, without them being able to give us an exam? And so they, they came up with all of these different variables, as you can see here. Um, and the ones that were most significant were spinal canal occlusion, the percentage of it, the higher the percent, the more likely to have a spinal cord injury the amount of facets, facet apposition that was lost and the amount of actual spinal cord compression on MRI. So um, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but that's number D here. So the loss of the canal space, uh, facet apposition, which is E on this slide, um, which is how much the facets have actually moved on each other. And then the actual space for the spinal cord, which is F on this slide. A, B, and C were not significantly associated with spinal cord injury. So treatment options, uh, halo immobilization is rarely used. It's really suboptimal optimal in subaxial cervical spine uh, because of the ability to move uh, underneath it. Closed reduction is indicated as we discussed in awake and cooperative patients and unilateral dislocations are generally harder, but they're more stable following reduction. MRI is important uh, to evaluate the soft tissue structures and um, then there's a, a number of published reduction techniques. There's a ton of reduction techniques published recently on anterior only reduction, largely because it's just harder. And uh, I think there's a desire to do surgery from the front because of the less than morbidity. Um, so there's been a whole bunch of stuff published on this in with all kinds of different methodology. The most commonly utilized though is use of Caspar pins with convergent placement. Um, and then basically squeezing them together with compression, which then should, in theory, unlock the facet joint, rotating it toward the side of the dislocation, and that should reduce it. Um, there's been uh, authors that have uh, used navigation to put in pedicle screws from the front and use those as distractors. There's people that drill out the facet through the disc space. Um, those have all been described, but they all get fairly complex, fairly fast. In terms of posterior reduction, it's relatively self-explanatory with dis direct distraction on the spinous processes or the um, lamina, and then le levering the dislocated joint to reduce. Uh, sometimes the SAP has to be drilled down in order to ease the reduction. Uh, this is kind of the technique that we use, uh, which was recently published in the Asian Spine Journal, which is basically using an instrument. We used a Penfield 4, they used a curette to kind of dislodge that facet. Um, along with traction. And it was quite stable afterwards. So I'll leave it at that. Is there any questions or comments? That was great, man. I appreciate it. Very good. One of the, one of the landmark articles that um, we could probably pull even for journal clubs, since I think we're still shy, is um, a paper by uh, Lifeso and Colucci back in the early... 2000s, maybe 2000. And it 
goes over um, a, a series looking at the anterior treatment of this. And, and typically, one of the downsides to going posterior is you're buying a two level fusion versus a single level. So, worth pulling that. It may be highlighted in that paper you already presented somewhere as one of their references. I'll try They're to find that. We can add that for journal club. Yeah. Lifeso, L I F E S O. Can you spell that again? L I F E S O. Okay. This is the lead author. So uh, ultimately, this guy did very well. He was discharged like post op day three. He's actually moved back to his home state now um, and is going to follow up with us remotely with x rays.